My name is Dario Hasenstab. I have two degrees in international affairs, and I'm here with Balder Hagritz, a former university professor of mine, as well as an IR consultant. And together, we're bursting the Western bubble. Today, we will analyze the West reconnecting with Venezuela through the lens of the Western bubble. Because while Western societies have many strengths and significant weaknesses, in order to analyze these, we use the concept of the Western bubble. If you would like to know more about this concept, how this podcast started, or who we are, make sure to listen to our introduction episode. Hi, Balder. Um, why are we speaking about this topic today? Why are we speaking about Venezuela? And more importantly, why did it take us close to 60 episodes um, of finally discovering the continent of Latin America? <laughs> I, I doubt you. Well, let's start with that last question. The reality is that uh, neither one of us are, is an expert or even a specialist when it comes to Latin America, it's the one continent I personally have never worked with in any professional capacity. We have a lot of uh, Latin American followers, but one always has to be incredibly careful not to extend um, the analysis beyond what we are actually knowledgeable on, right? So in that sense, Latin America has always been a little bit intimidating, certainly for me. Um, simply because my level of knowledge and understanding of the region is not high enough to actually make large um, predictions on or to to actually make certain claims on. However, uh, and that goes back to the first bit of your question, um, you can look at the way that the world, and in our case especially the West, reacts to Latin America and in today's episode specifically how it reacts to Venezuela. And there our expertise is more present simply because uh, you can see the Western bubble very much present in the way that Europe and North America have dealt with Venezuela over the past 25 years, but certainly over the past 10 years or so. Venezuela has been hugely important in geopolitics has because of its significant oil supplies, has been hugely relevant to regional dynamics. And the West is now coming to the realization that ignoring Venezuela just because they don't like the government in Caracas is not going to work in the long term. And so now they're trying to reconnect with the Maduro government. They're trying to reconnect with Venezuela in a way that um, displays kind of their hypocrisy, if you like, or their inconsistency when it comes to foreign policy making. And what are the facts? Venezuela is a country of 28 million people in South America, bordered by the Caribbean Sea in the north and the Amazon rainforest in the south. Venezuela has the world's largest proven oil reserves and is a founding member of OPEC. Since 1998, Venezuela has been ruled by a left-wing socialist party under two presidents, Hugo Chavez, until his death in 2013, and Nicolas Maduro, Chavez's chosen successor until now. Under Chavez, oil prices were high and funded robust social programs, but since Maduro took over, oil prices have significantly fallen and the Venezuelan economy has collapsed, causing massive inflation, poverty, and over 7 million people to flee the country since 2014. In 2019, the opposition, led by Juan Guaido, declared that the previous election held in 2018 was fraudulent. The opposition was supported by the United States, who tightened sanctions on Venezuela in hope of pressuring Maduro to step down and reinstate democratic institutions. In October 2023, Washington and Caracas met in Barbados for negotiations facilitated by Norway, which resulted in the United States announcing a six-month suspension on Venezuelan sanctions. What is the bubble? So when we talk about this topic, it's also very important from my side to one more time uh, kind of state that neither of us are experts on this or specialists. I mean, I have a few friends from Venezuela and I read about the country in the news every few months, uh, but that's about, um, that's about it. But it is very important to talk about this topic, especially now that it's back in the news with Washington announcing that six-month suspension of Venezuelan sanctions. Um, let's start maybe a little bit with a timeline, because I'm not sure how many of our listeners are super familiar with, uh, with Venezuela as well. And here we see that Venezuela, just like most other countries, have always been a little bit divided, right, between the middle class uh, connected to the West um, and then the working class who were very well represented by, by Hugo Chavez. Um, and then you had this election in 1998. 
where Chavez was elected and suddenly you could feel the West losing their natural allies within the middle class and started to feel a little bit uncomfortable with socialism and all of those other things that we don't like. And in, in many ways, um, Venezuela has been a really good example of how the Western bubble can be weaponized at a local level, in this case by Chavez, to consolidate power internally, right? By saying, hey, you know what, all those middle class leaders, those politicians, if you like the Guaidos of the 1990s, um, they are essentially perpetuating a neo-colonial Western dominated approach towards our country. We are rich in oil, we are a proud nation, and we are gonna do things differently. And we are gonna stand up for our own rights and specifically the workers' rights. And what you see is that that puts that middle class in a very difficult position because they don't want to be seen as anti-nationalist. They don't want to be seen as anti-Venezuelan. They don't want to be seen as pawns by the West. Uh, but at the same time, they understand that they kind of need that 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 Western economic support for their own um, investments, for their own um, policy making, etc. So the way that the Chavez weaponized, if you like, the existence of a Western bubble has been fascinating to observe. And then in 2000, uh, the year 2000, you quickly start seeing the consolidation of power uh, from Hugo Chavez. And here already some of these trends that, I mean, my Venezuelan friends always tell me that's, that's when it all went down. Um, you see the erosion of private property, then a few years later in 2009, you see term limits in Venezuela being abolished. So you see these things that from, right, let's, let's speak from the inside Western bubble perspective. Like, let's say, let's say if I were to see this in Germany, that's the moment when I would start getting really, really concerned about the, tur the turns my country is taking. Yes, I remember in 2006, 2007, um, lecturing at a, at a university. And at that time, so this was before the really extreme policies were implemented. I, I called Chavez a dictator and there was kind of a gasp in the, among the audience. A lot of Latin Americans were there as well. And a lot of people at that time felt that that was too harsh a label. Uh, but it was clear that Chavez had no interest in sort of the Western liberal democratic model. It was clear he, he hadn't hidden that in any way that he was moving towards a West Bolivarian revolution, a socialist uh, slash kind of almost communist kind of uh, perspective on how to uh, run the country. And it is interesting that from a Western perspective, the moment you call someone a dictator, rather than that just being a factual kind of observation, like this is an authoritarian regime, straight away there's a huge moral baggage coming with that, right? Because all of a sudden you are the bad guy, you are on the wrong side of history. Whereas those two things are not necessarily parallel to each other. Someone can be a authoritarian leader and still be a good leader. I'm not saying that Chavez was a good leader, but I'm saying that those two things are not the same. To say someone is dictatorial in their tendencies doesn't mean that they're necessarily on the wrong side of history. Yet in our Western bubble kind of mind, those two things get conflated immediately. They, they do. The moment you said authoritarian leader, I shrugged a little bit. Um, the, the, the audience can't see this on the, on the camera, but there is, right, there, there is something that this word carries, dictator, authoritarian leader, um, that I think immediately makes us go, ooh, that's uh, not a, doesn't sound like a very pleasant person to be around. And this is the obligatory moment where I say, yeah, to me in some way as well, because I really like living in a liberal democracy. I feel very comfortable with that. And I wouldn't want to live in an authoritarian regime for a lot of reasons. However, that says more about our upbringing and our set of assumptions and our internal inherent biases rather than some kind of objective philosophical truth that's out there. Right. And I think that distinction is not sufficiently made. I mean, we, we've talked about um, uh, our basically our podcast model being copied into other countries, uh, that there should be a Chinese bubble podcast and a Russian bubble podcast. And I, I just imagined, uh, I don't know, a, a Russian or a Chinese person uh, shrugging at the mention of the word democracy, because for them, it seems unorganized chaos and nothing ever gets done. Right. Uh, I would I would think that might be might be similar for people from other countries and other cultures. <laughs> 
c- certainly from a uh, from a Chinese perspective that you see that very clearly among um, among if you like the intellectuals uh, in Beijing. Uh, the only little addition to that is that the word democracy in itself is being used by many different forms, right? I mean, the Soviet Union used democracy to describe itself. Uh, it depends on how you define democracy, but certainly the Western political model is not that attractive to many others around the world because they all, they see exactly this chaos and they see this decline, right? They see this decay. And so to say that Chavez in Venezuela implemented all an authoritarian system went from the 1990s, a relatively um, robust democracy, I'm saying relative because they also in the 1990s Venezuela did have very serious political problems obviously, but he took it from being an elected leader of a country to a almost fully authoritarian regime that in itself is just a factual observation, whether that is morally positive or negative that depends on the eye of the beholder to put it like that that I'm leaving to the Venezuelans I think those are the those are the only people that should be concerned about this, uh, whether they like it or not. Um, and then, well, let's let's move on in the timeline. So, in two thousand thirteen, Chavez dies, and Nicolas Maduro succeeds him, chosen by Chavez, and, and him kind of get going into power is combined within the the oil price, uh, you know, going down, high inflation, uh, and the economy is right. You, you can no longer f- finance all your social policies that that maybe made Chavez really popular uh, in the beginning. Um, so you see things going really downhill from here, where then you have the National Assembly, where they kind of lose control. Um, well, the Socialist Party loses control, so the party of Maduro. And then you start seeing mass protests in 2016, calling for the removal of Maduro. So you do you do see this. And this is also the time when I started university in 2017. And I remember a lot of the Venezuelan students coming in some of them being in serious financial trouble, saying that, I don't know, a few months ago, the salary of my parents was enough to pay for tuition. Suddenly, this is no longer the case. I remember um, a, a friend from uh, from Venezuela uh, saying, oh, my dad is going to visit and he's one of the protesters, right? He's been arrested a few times. And so you feel very, like, I, I remember at this time feeling very sympathetic towards towards the Venezuelans uh, because, I don't know, it seemed like they were suffering and that they were really fighting for, for the country, in a sense. Yes, and... This became even more explicit and more problematic with this change of guard from Chavez to Maduro, because it's probably worth mentioning that even though Chavez obviously um, was not universally liked, and there was with both within Venezuela uh, as well as internationally straight away a lot of criticism of his policies, of his personality, of all kinds of things. At least he had a plan for the country. Whether that was a good plan or not is a whole different story, but he had a plan. Maduro essentially was a bureaucrat who was appointed by Chavez and who never had an idea, at least I'm saying that as an outsider, but never seemed to have an idea where he wanted to take the country. And then that combination of a leader who just sort of happens to become leader without that idealism, without a intellectual background, without a vision together with seemingly infinite oil supplies is a hugely dangerous combination because that leads to bad policymaking because in the short term you can depend on your oil supply to bail you out basically. You can buy your way out of trouble. In the long run, that does enormous damage to the structure of your country. It does enormous damage to uh, the rest of the economy. It does enormous damage to your balance with other political forces. Uh, You become more isolated, you become more entrenched. And that's exactly what you see, especially during the Maduro years. Mm. And at the same time, you also have a lack of investments, right? Because I think there is this lack of vision. You have a lack of investments into your oil infrastructure. And now you have problems of actually pumping out uh, oil, which, I mean, yes, Venezuela has the, the biggest proven oil reserves, but as uh, my Venezuelan friends will, will never get tired of mentioning, they also have the best oil, right? It's quality level is, is, is the best oil in the world, which, I mean, makes it even more tragic that you have a country that theoretically has everything it needs to turn into, I don't know, let's say Saudi Arabia or the UAE, right? So you could modernize the country, um, but things aren't going well. And then I think the moment when, at least in the international tension, this uh, Venezuela, Venezuela really was moved into the center, 
was during this 2018 election that was official. Well, it was according to the authorities won by Maduro, but there were claims from all sides that this was a rigged election, especially from the opposition. And then you see more and more protests, and this leads then to 2019, where you have uh, Juan Guaido, um, kind of a leader from the opposition, claiming that the <laughs> election was fraudulent. And basically, you know, as the president of the parliament, um, putting himself at the leadership of the country, saying that Maduro is not the legitimate leader. I am the legitimate leader because I represent the highest you know, democratically elected body in the country. And therefore, I am now the leader. And here you then see the Western bubble coming into place because suddenly everyone in the West is excited and jumping onto the bandwagon. Yeah, it's one of those problems with the word election, and, and you see this all over the world. Um, I am very familiar with many sub-Saharan African cases where elections are somehow seen as equivalent to democracy, which obviously they're not. Um, and I don't think that anyone could argue that in 2018, um, Venezuela was a democracy, because of course the elections did not fulfill typically the, the principles that you would expect with a democracy. And then you get a whole conversation about the fairness of elections and all that, whereas the system is simply no longer built around, democ uh, about, around elections. And the West is very confused often by that, right? Because they, they tell leaders, hey, we need you to have elections. As long as you have elections, we can deal, do business with you as if those elections actually are a solution. Um, very often, in the case of Venezuela, but also in the case of the Democratic, Re Democratic Republic of Congo and many other cases that I'm familiar with, you see that elections actually create violence. They create upheaval. They create problems within society if those democratic institutions aren't robust. And that's exactly what you, uh, what you saw in 2018, 2019, where the world gets outraged about fraudulent elections. Whereas in reality, the problem is 25 years of moving away from any kind of democratic political processes, right? And um, the, the, the focus on those specific elections is a little bit of a red herring in many ways. And when we're then looking at the, at the reaction, I mean, again, I was studying at the time and I remember a bit of excitement, at least in the classrooms, right? So there was a bit of excitement, oh, a democratic leader. And again, because you have so much sympathy for your Venezuelan friends who are all suffering, um, there was, yeah, there was definitely excitement. And you can also see this within the European Union and the United States, of course, right? At the time you had uh, Spain in particular really pushing for this, but the Europeans were very happy to immediately recognize Guaido as the legitimate leader of Venezuela and uh, the United States as well. And there was a bit of this democracy is coming to or coming back to Venezuela feeling, uh, let's call it the Latin American Spring, right? <laughs> Based on the Arab Spring of 10 years earlier. Yes, ab absolutely. And I, I remember this um, from a professorial perspective, if you like, because I was teaching that day as well. And there was definitely a real sense of change in the air among students, right? Including Venezuelan students, shout out to Clarissa, uh, who spoke to me about it. Um, and there were a lot of interpretations saying, well, this is obvious. Um, Maduro is now blocking the rightfully elected leader, Guaido, from uh, taking his position. And the problem with that kind of analysis is, of course, that the system no longer was functioning. So if the system is no longer functioning, it no longer functions for Maduro, but it also no longer func functions for Guaido. And then the claims of, yeah, but if you look at the constitution, then this that becomes all like a subjective interpretation of events. And those who desperately wanted to see change, which I think is most people, certainly outside of Venezuela, most Venezuelans outside of Venezuela, but also most Westerners, desperately wanted the government to change away from Maduro into a Guaido-led coalition, if you like, they turned the subjective analysis into something ob supposedly objective. And that's where things go wrong. The conclusion in 2018, 2019 was obviously the political system in Venezuela no longer works. It no, it's broken. It, it, it no longer has the democratic credential that, that it had. And if you want to have change, then Arguing about elections is not the way forward, but that's exactly what happened. And then Guaido publishing this video on the 30th of April, 
um, like the, the kickoff of a revolution one day before the 1st of May, symbolically, um, with um, uh, this clear tone of this is the moment I'm posting this video with my mobile phone. This is the moment in which we are going to reestablish freedom and democracy to Venezuela. And that led to a certain, if you like, giddiness in the international environment. But at the local level, the reaction was extremely muted. And when maybe Guaido was hoping for millions of Venezuelans going to the street, it was thousands of Venezuelans going to the street and they didn't have the political power or the impact that to, to change anything, essentially, thereby making it less likely that um, any kind of demo the democratic process would be reestablished because then the Maduro government could just dismiss this kind of revolt as, oh, these are just a few Western uh, powered dissidents who uh, do not represent the people in Venezuela. And, and that rhetoric uh, had justification um, because here we are talking also about US President Donald Trump. And I remember, you know, just, I mean, there was still when the time when he was on Twitter and Twitter was still a more or less normal place. And, uh, you know, you could read tweets of him saying, oh, trust me, I'm monitoring the situation in Venezuela very closely. And then there was a lot of talk about US intervention. The United States, I don't know how a US intervention would look like, whether it was be the CIA or the military, but in some way supporting why though, because of course you have an, an oil rich country and if they are a democracy, that's really good for the United States. Um, but within a week, right, it became rather clear that, yes, the European countries had kind of accepted Guaido as, as the legitimate leader. The rest of the world didn't. <laughs> um, that, right, that. Western bubble, hello. Um, you have to talk of a US intervention. You have Trump saying a few crazy things, you know, not normal things in 2018, 2019. But as I said, within a week, it was kind of over. Yeah, and... Again, it is important to emphasize here the inconsistency in this kind of analysis from a Western perspective, right? So either you say the system is working well and whoever wins, wins, or you say there is something blocking the system from working well and therefore Maduro didn't really win the election, but he um, is still in power. What is going on here? And at that moment, you cannot draw objective conclusions about who the winner is because then the system is broken. So to automatically jump at, oh, then Guaido has to be the new leader is a fallacy. It's, it's a logical problem that the West often faces because really what they do is they choose the people who push the right buttons from their perspective, who say the right things from their perspective. Guaido, young, um, opposition to a authoritarian regime uh, seen as um, understanding um, better the, the, the importance of democratic institutions. So we sympathize with that person and we put him in front there as obviously the, the right person for this job. Whereas in the end, it is not up to the West to decide that, it's up to the Venezuelans. And if the political system is broken, you've got almost an unresolvable problem, but not one that can be imposed from the outside, not one that can be implemented from the outside, and certainly not one that can be forced from the outside, right? So after this very short um, kind of overview of the last 20 years in Venezuela, um, which, I mean, I think for the purpose of this podcast, we did it justice, but in case you're interested in the history of Venezuela and, uh, you know, what are the problems within the country, then I encourage you to, to look for other sources because here we're focusing a lot on the Western bubble perspective, which is why I think now it would be interesting to look into the geopolitical implications of, you know, 2019 and the aftermath and see what shifted and how it shifted uh, since then. Because one of the things, you know, after the West realized Maduro is not going anywhere and Guaido is not really getting anywhere, um, the West reacted in its typical way, right, with a lot of sanctions onto the country, right? I mean, there were already existing ones, but they just kept on adding more sanctions. And with this, pushed Venezuela very much into the direction of Russia, China, um, you know, basically the new axis of evil, if you want to call it that way, re reinforcing that belief that, well, then they are evil, right? I mean, if there's a country that you think 
you don't like because they're authoritarian and it's Nicolas Maduro in charge. And then he's doing business with Russia and China. Well, then he has to be really evil. Yes. And it, in reality, this was a path that had already been started by Chavez, right? Who was identifying himself as a non-Western actor. He's trying to connect to those who, from his perspective, oppose the West, including Iran and others. And then um, that already had made the West very nervous. When these moments happened, it sort of burst, not the bubble, but it very much burst the, the kind of restraint that the West had with respect to Venezuela. Right now they had this opposition leader that seemed attractive and that seemed to hit the right notes. They had a Maduro government that didn't seem to know what it was doing. And they had China and Russia interfering with what the West perceived as their sphere of influence. And that's when the bubble went all out and became essentially a regi regime change mechanism, trying to force Venezuela into changing its government. The problem, of course, is that none of those kinds of policies actually have that desired outcome because all it does is it entrenches the Maduro government into its relationship with Russia and China. It entrenches the government inside into its bunker mentality, if you like. And um, as long as there is no major revolt or rebellion or revolution within Venezuela itself, these Western sections are only likely to hurt the average person in the streets, uh, not so much the government itself. And this is something that we've seen over and over again with authoritarian regimes being embargoed and boycotted by by Western nations, right? Yeah, I think this might be an interesting uh, topic for the future, the Western perspective on sanctions and maybe also the morality of sanctions. Um, but that, that, as I said, for, for a future episode, um, because if we want to look um, at, at right the relationship between Venezuela and, and, and China, for example, because I think this might be a very interesting one, right? I mean, China is then going all in um, because, hey, the West doesn't want Venezuela. Venezuela has a lot of oil and a lot of very good oil and cheap oil. So why not? And then you see this, right, that since... Since 2022, um, you see that the the average flows right of, of oil from Caracas to Beijing is we're talking about 430,000 barrels a day. That's 60 to 70 percent of Venezuela's exports. Um, China is also the biggest lender to uh, to Venezuela, um, where I think we're talking about. I mean, well, I mean, according to the research by our lovely researchers uh, Aston and UG, um, we, we're looking at 50 billion uh, US dollars in in loans um, to from China to Venezuela, which they're basically repaying through oil shipments. So you can clearly see China capitalizing on this, and the, the West losing out is is um, yeah is, is a very well light form of saying it. They're basically completely out of the picture. Yes, and the, the, the two important sort of large-scale observations to make here are, on the one hand, that this is put in the context of ideology, right? It's put in the context of authoritarianism versus democracy, whereas in reality, it is much more nuanced. Authority, there's not just one type of authoritarianism and there's not one type of democracy. And in that sense, if something happens in the next year, the elections actually take place in a relatively free environment and the opposition uh, wins those elections. It's not as if all of a sudden Venezuela will say goodbye to China or Russia, right? It's not, it's not that you can divide the worlds between the good guys and the bad guys in that sense. And Venezuela will, for at least for the foreseeable future, have close relations with Russia and China. And that's unavoidable. That has very little to do with internal politics. It's got a lot to do with geopolitics. And, and this, this simplified idea that's often exists in Western minds of the moment they become democratic, they're going to be our friends, has, of course, been shown to be untrue, certainly over the past 20 years or so. Now, the other big observation here is that from a geopolitical perspective, if you're the West, this might maybe possibly perhaps make sense if you were to actually live in a Cold War scenario where there are two genuine power blocks. And it basically becomes a situation of who controls most of the territory globally. It's sort of, sort of like a 1950s, 1960s scenario. There maybe you could make the case for this. But the reality of our world today is that 
it's not a Cold War scenario. It is a scenario where the West is losing power left, right and center, economic power, diplomatic power, and all that. They don't know how to deal with that. And China and Russia and other countries are not one coherent bloc. They have different sets of interests. So, but with the West pretending that they're fighting some kind of good fight um, against a, a coalition or an axis of evil, means that the West is blind to the actual nuanced realities of the 21st century. And it means that they are losing ground every day by playing this game, whereas the rest of the world says, sorry, we, we don't want to play. We don't want to be part of this game. We will deal with whoever we can deal with. If tomorrow the United States makes us a better offer than, than China, we'll work with uh, the United States. If Europe wants to out-compete uh, Russia, we will look at Europe, but please stop putting us into those two categories because that's not the reality of 2023. And one country that is particularly good at playing this, you know, just global game um, is India. Because India is, I mean, we, we've mentioned it uh, quite a few times as the perfect anti-bubble perspective because they're not as aggressive as China because China is kind of trying to, right, to really push the West away and establish itself as the other big actor. And then you have India, which just says exactly what you just uh, summarized, who makes us the best offer. So you can see um, India being the second biggest, uh, basically, importer uh, from uh, of, of uh, Venezuelan oil right after China. Um, but you don't see this, you know, this, uh, yeah, this, this type of uh, relationship where, you know, China has an all-weather partnership with Venezuela and India just says, well, we don't need to conquer the world. We like oil. We do not necessarily support your political system. But please, just trade with us. That's all we want to do. And, and as a result, they go under the radar. Nobody in 2019 or 2020 wrote about India. Um, everything, is, if I look at European or North American uh, perspective, wrote about India being a supporter of the Maduro government. But in practical terms, they very much were in the sense that they were just doing business with Maduro and they were happily doing business with Maduro, second, second largest importer of oil, etc., etc. And as a result, um, it becomes completely evident that this Western obsession with Russia and China has very little to do with actually their impact on Venezuela. It's got everything to do with their perceived nature internally, right? India is seen as a democracy, despite Modi's, if you like, also slightly authoritarian tendencies. Um, India is seen as a democracy. Russia and China aren't. Therefore, India can support Venezuela and get away with it. Nobody will write about it. The moment Russia or China do it, they that they emphasize or they reinforce our belief that they're the bad guys in international relations. And one last player I, I want to mention, um, simply because I think that the Scandinavian countries are always getting way too good of a reputation in today's world, uh, is from Europe. And we're talking about Norway, because as I read out during the fact sheet, Norway uh, was mediating between the United States uh, and, and Venezuela. Yeah, but Norway, you know, you have your own interests. And I don't like this you know, perception that the Scandinavian countries are so neutral and, and that are just, um, there might be a, a certain uh, jealousy from a German perspective because everything up there is going so well. But uh, Norway has a very clear interest um, in, in the things with Venezuela not going super well uh, because for them, they can export a lot of natural resources to the rest of Europe and the world. I was going to say that, you know, it sounds like a bitter German sort of being envious of, <laughs> of Scandinavian systems. But yeah, of course, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it, it was kind of hilarious, but not in a ha -ha funny kind of way that Norway put itself forward as a peacemaker in Venezuela, which I could kind of accept from maybe, you know, uh, an Asian country that doesn't have any direct connections with Venezuela or maybe Switzerland, if we look at Europe um, or some Luxembourg, some place like that. But oh, Norway obviously has enormous geopolitical interest in whatever happens in Venezuela. And as a result, a country like Norway should never be able to tell the world we are peacemakers in this other oil-rich environment. It is not 
consistent with reality. And once again, the only way where Norway gets away with that is that we think of Norway, and understandably so, by the way, as a lovely uh, the democratic country, uh, liberal country, very much falling within our Western bubble sensitivities, right? Like, oh, they're the good guys. And of course, Norway has some interest in oil, but in reality, they also just want to make the world a peaceful place. No, no, no. They, the Norwegian government is not really that keen on the peace aspect. They are keen on controlling natural resources in Venezuela. Let's not be blinded by this identity politics. In many ways, that's what exactly what we see over and over again, right? That as long as we believe that your identity is righteous, you can get away sometimes literally with murder. And the idea of Norway mediating Venezuela is kind of insanity. And can you explain to our listeners what is the problem? Um, when we're talking about the the problem with this, in, with, you know, with the Western bubble in this scenario, I mean, one of them is from a Western perspective, obviously, that Venezuela is being pushed towards the players you don't like, Russia, China. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, we've seen Chavez trying to do this very early on as well, right? Kind of creating a connection with Iran. Um, and whenever you read an article about which countries are on the list of trying to dethrone the dollar as the dominant currency in the world. You always read Venezuela, Iran and, and China. But right, there's no surprise about this, right? If you push everyone who's evil into a corner, um, at some point, if you keep on pushing countries, that corner is going to become a very big one. And uh, you, you might end up in a scenario uh, where the majority of the world suddenly looks at the West uh, and it's like, hey, hello, listen, dear West, you're no longer as strong as you used to be. Um, things are going to go differently now. Yeah, and, and, and Chavez already under, seemed to understood that. Again, I want to emphasize that without me being a fan of Chavez in any way, shape or form, it's not up to me to be a fan or not to be a fan, he had a vision that exactly went in this direction. Like, hey, you know what? They don't really like me in Washington. They don't really like me in London or in Madrid. Fine. Then I will show them what the consequence of this is. I am going to be part of this other dynamic, this more modern dynamic that looks at the 21st century in more nuanced terms. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to countries that the West doesn't want to talk to. And of course, that is a huge boon. That is a huge presence that then the West gives to a country like China or certainly a country like India. And it seems that Western capitals are blinded to that. It's, it seems that they do not see this dynamic because they still wake up every morning believing in this good versus evil narrative, this either you're with us or you're against this narrative. And if you're not clearly a Western liberal democracy, then obviously you are somehow antiquated and you are somehow um, going to have to change in the long term because we all know that everyone in the long term will become democratic. It blinds the West to that kind of, by the, with that kind of thinking, blinds the West to the reality that it's actually quite modern what Chavez did. It is quite, you know, progressive from an international perspective to say, I don't need approval by Washington. I am fine not to get that approval and I will hold funny speeches in the UN um, mocking George W. Bush and talking about George W. Bush being the devil and all that kind of thing. I'm embracing this because I know that the 21st century is not going to be the 1990s anymore. There's another problem or another huge piece of damage um, that also comes from the Western bubble. Because usually in this section, right, we talk about the overall behavior of the West and the geopolitics. Um, and I mean, we both of us like to talk about individuals within international relations, but usually we talk about leaders. So about Modi, about Xi Jinping, about Putin, about Joe Biden, about Nicolas Maduro. However, in this specific you know, case study of Venezuela, there's also one individual who's uh, not at all important. Um, who, you know, used to work for the U.S. military before, then was kind of, you know, working for a private security firm, um, who at some point decided, you know what, I'm going to partake in international relations as well. I, let me look at the situation in Venezuela. I really don't like these damn dictators there. And you have someone like Jordan Goodrow, um, together with uh, 40 other mercenaries, and I think one contact within the Venezuelan military, I think his, yeah, his, his name was Javier Nieto Quintero, um, and let us stage a coup. <laughs> um, and so this leads to the situation where there's two boats with a few mercenaries on there. 
um, now attacking the country of Venezuela, you know, a big military base, and my favorite part of it, announcing it on Twitter uh, while they're doing it, um, and then being, and then they were surprised that the Venezuelan army was greeting them at the, at the entry of the port, basically saying, hello, nice idea of you trying to overthrow a country of 40 people, but we're going to arrest you now, right? This and it, this is, I mean, I, I remember for, for Raya, um, I once wrote a daily update about this, and I, I I'd call it define failure, wannabe Rambo, Jordan du Goudreau, because this this has to be an American who watched too many movies, right? Yeah, there's, there's so many things to unpack here. Uh, there are some questions about what were there any connections with intelligence agencies? Was there any governmental, U.S. governmental, I mean, um, influence on this? But that's just pure speculation. Let's start with the fact that everything you just described sounds almost identical to the Bay of Pigs. Um, situation with the exception that at least the Bay of Pigs situation in the 1960s for those Cuban dissidents trying to overthrow the newly established uh, Castro regime, the, the newly established communist regime in Cuba, at least there they were um, Cubans who wants to do it, right? Which is a little bit more consistent at least. The idea of American mercenaries just going into a country that they're not particularly familiar with and maybe working with a few insiders within Caracas and then saying, you know what, we're going to bring Democracy and freedom to the Venezuelan people is, of course, once again, so disconnected from anything serious and anything realistic that it's almost laughable if it doesn't have such significant and serious consequences because people did die as a result and uh, people were arrested as a result and it led to further hardship. So besides the insanity of a operation like this, it is fascinating once again to observe this idea that democracy, in this case in Venezuela, is just around the corner. All you need to do is uh, pushing it a little bit with some military means, right? Just give it that little nudge. Just get rid of Maduro, get rid of a few people around Maduro, and everything will fall perfectly into place, which is not how democracy works. The democratic system in Venezuela, as in many other countries, is deeply broken. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, is up for the Venezuelans to decide. I think most Venezuelans believe it's a bad thing. Um, but that is not something that you can fix with a quick military operation. Now, there were even rumors, and not just rumors, there were actual plans, but they never got to any practical stage, that the Trump administration, guided by John Bolton, an influential neoconservative who's never seen a war he doesn't like, uh, were actually planning to do something similar and more serious, right? The United States actually militarily intervening. And I heard some Venezuelans, uh, very much on the opposition side, of course, anti-Maduro, uh, being all excited about that. Yeah, they're gonna, they're, the United States is gonna intervene and finally we'll get rid of these authoritarian figures and we'll reestablish Venezuelan democracy. But that is not how it works. Imagine this. Imagine a U.S. intervention, military intervention in Venezuela. Imagine the, the outcry from other regional countries who think, hang on, what's going on here? Imagine the reaction from that, those segments in the Venezuelan population that still support Maduro. Um, imagine the long-term difficulties that the United States would have in actually stabilizing the political system and knowing where their, their power stops and where they should let Venezuelans take over, it is just opening an enormous can of worms, if you like Pandora's box, whatever um, other metaphor you can use, for a disastrous foreign policy. And very reminiscent of things such as situations like Iraq, for example, right? Where you, you saw the problems that you have after the military intervention. So... This idea of using the military, whether it's 40 mercenaries, basically amateurs, or whether it is the power of the U.S. government militarily intervening into a country with a broken democratic system and then somehow bringing peace and prosperity to that country is simply a delusion. It is the most egregious example of the Western bubble. And if I were Venezuelan, it would be the last thing I wanted to be subjected to, even if I deeply, deeply hated Maduro and I deeply wanted the opposition to take over. The idea of 
foreigners going into my country and messing up the entire establishment and the entire national system, and also, if you like, national pride, leading probably to long-term conflict and civil war would be the last thing I would want. And what now? So what's the alternative? Um, I mean, well, let's let's not start discussing scenarios on how to overthrow Maduro um, or or how to solve that problem. I think that's uh, that's not for us to to figure out. But when we look back at the Western bubble perspective, I mean, the West has lost its influence over Venezuela. You now see, I mean, you already saw this after the Russian invasion, right? When the West realized, oh, we can't use Russian oil and gas. Mm, what alternatives do we have? Oh, you, you're Venezuela. You already saw efforts to um, to kind of reconnect with them there. They weren't super, right? They, they weren't super successful because it would be a win for Maduro and Maduro would be legitimized, which from a Western view, that would be the worst thing to happen. But what is going to happen, right? I mean, the West is trying to reconnect with Venezuela. How is this going to look like from a Western bubble perspective? Yeah, so now you have this fascinating process that you can observe uh, every day in your local newspaper, if you live in Europe or North America, where because of the realization that the West cannot overthrow Maduro and the realization that they're losing geopolitical ground because they're basically forfeiting this a relation with a huge oil supplier, uh, giving free reign to Beijing and Moscow to do their thing. They need to change tack. They need to change the direction from the past because it simply hasn't worked. And that creates the if you like, marketing or propaganda problem of namely of rehabilitating the Maduro government to some extent to make it palatable, to make it possible to talk to them again. Because over the past 10 years, they've been put in this corner of the Maduro regime is inherently evil and we will not do business with them. And as a result, um, we're going to uh, put sanctions on them and we're going to punish those who do work with Venezuela and that is now no longer tenable. So the outcome is that slowly this rehabilitation process of Maduro requires for the West to find cover, to find a way to say, oh, it's okay again to work with Maduro. It's okay again to uh, lift sanctions. And how do you do that? Well, exactly what Venezuela, what Caracas has been doing, dangling elections in front of the Western eyes, like a shiny object, like a dog following a shiny object. Here you've got elections. Okay, now the West can claim, oh, Venezuela is on the right path again. They're, they're starting to once again embrace their deterministic future of being a liberal democracy and working with them will now accelerate that process. And if we were to continue the sanctions, if we were to continue the isolation, we would holding back the Venezuelan people. Now, of course, this is a whole load of nonsense, given that one set of elections does not change the inherent political system especially given that those elections are unlikely to actually occur in any kind of democratic free environment. Um, but that doesn't matter for the West. What matters for the West is simply the idea that they can now claim once again that Venezuela is an acceptable negotiating partner and that allows them to reoccupy a geopolitical space that they have lost because of their own bad policy making. This seems like a great moment to end today's conversation on the West reconnecting with Venezuela. If you have any questions, comments or regards, make sure to send us an email to thewesternbubble at gmail.com and we will try to incorporate them in our following episodes. Thank you very much to the listeners for joining us today. Make sure to join us again next week when we burst the Western bubble. That is it from my side, Boulder. Which closing quote did you pick for us today? I chose a quote from former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi from India, who very wisely said, winning or losing of the election is less important than strengthening the country. Mm -hmm.